Hello friends. My name is Manoj Soprani and I welcome you all on behalf of the Edupedia world. Today with this video we mark the beginning of one of the most important and interesting subject of CA final and that is strategic financial management. Before starting out with any particular topic of this subject I would like to throw some light on the overview what this particular subject deals out with how to maximize your chances of scoring exemption or distinction in the subject during the course of time i have realized that students feel that sfm is one of the most toughest subject in ca final but believe me guys that is not the case it is one such subject which is which is thoroughly interesting just like accounts costing direct tax loss indirect tax loss corporate loss this particular subject deals with concepts and the entire conceptual clarity which is provided in this subject makes you see through ca final though i agree that this subject is vast however with proper smart work and conceptual clarity one can easily crack the subject also some students have made the concept that sfm is all about derivatives portfolio and capital budgeting but there is a slight, slight difference if you have analyzed the paper properly according to me there are a lot of small topics which are easier and can be prepared with 100% accuracy and efficiency in short span of time rather than devoting your exact and large amount of your time in on preparing these particular subject topics it is better to focus on smaller topics as well because they constitute more than 30% of the entire syllabus in this examination paper this subject is broadly covered into 10 major topics dividend policy leasing mergers and acquisitions forex management financial services mutual fund security analysis derivatives portfolio management and capital budgeting having said that theory is no less important in this subject theory approximately contains more than 16 to 20% of your total weightage of examination questions the major theory usually comes from the topics of dividend policy leasing forex mergers and security analysis we will be covering all these topics one after the other in our forthcoming presentations but before starting out this particular subject with you guys i want to make sure that you understand one thing clearly revision and conceptual clarity of this subject is the key to say ensure that you revise your topics time and again and do ensure one thing more practice all the sums by your hand don't try to go for any kind of method which pertains to rectification or directly checking out the solution and getting up the mugging of the answers rather than going for that kind of any process it's better you put your pen down and try to solve each and every pro problem on paper that is going to help you in providing the best presentation in examination hall as well don't forget to refer the materials which are being issued by our institute the institute of chartered accountants of india the study material the practice manual the suggested answers the mock tests the rtps which are available in any of the stores of icai go get that and even in, in fact online that is available in market right so you can just google it up and get those solutions on your desktop this is particularly going to help you out immensely while preparing for this particular subject time and again i'll be sharing these tips with you so that you can start adapting these kind of changes and get the possibility of scoring maximum number of marks in your ca final examination so let's begin with today's topic today's with today's topic we are going to cover the basic strategic financial management principles and related analogies in this presentation so before starting out with what is strategic financial management let's first consider financial management in a layman term financial management simply means a process of making financial decisions commonly there are three types of financial decisions 
financing decision, investment decision and dividend decision. So let's discuss about financing decision first. It involves estimating the requirement of funds, deciding about the leverage, evaluating various sources of finance and finally raising the finance in such a way that the overall cost of capital is minimum and the risk is at optimum level. A company can raise finance for, from any kind of uh, various resources such as by way of issue of shares, debentures or by taking loans and advances as well. Deciding how much to raise from which source is the concern of financing decision. Mainly, the sources of finance can be divided into two categories, owner's fund and borrowed fund. Share capital and retained earnings constitute owner's fund and debentures, loans, bonds, etc. constitute borrowed fund. The main concern of any finance manager in any enterprise is to decide how much to raise from owner's fund and how much to raise from borrowed fund. While taking this decision, the finance manager compares the disadvantages and advantages of different sources of finance. The borrowed funds have to be paid back and involve some degree of risk as well. Whereas in other overall owner funds, there is no fixed commitment like that of repayment and this there is no risk involved. But finance manager prefers a mix of both types just to ensure that the proper leverage can be done. Under financing decision, finance manager fixes a ratio of own owner fund and borrowed fund in capital structure of the company. So what are those factors which affect the financing decision? It is the cost, it is the risk, it is the cash flow position of the company which also helps in selecting the securities. With smooth and steady cash flow companies can easily afford borrowed fund securities but when companies have the shortage of cash flow then they must go for owner equity securities only. Control considerations are also being taken care of while taking care of financing decisions. Flotation costs which is being involved in issue of securities like brokers commission, underwriting fees, expenses on prospectors etc. Firm has to take care of these costs as well. One has to ensure that the firm prefers, prefers securities which involve the least flotation costs. Fixed operating costs has to be minimal and the state of capital market also affects the decision for financial management. The conditions in capital market also help in deciding the type of securities has to be raised. During boom period, it is easy to sell equity shares as people are ready to take the risk, whereas during depression period, there is more demand for debt securities in capital market. Next comes investment decisions. Such such decisions involve investment in working capital and fixed asset and evaluating the projects under consideration. The management should be guided by getting the maximum return by keeping the risk at optimum level. This decision relates to a careful selection of assets in which funds will be invested by the firm. A firm has many options to invest their funds. But firm has to select the most appropriate investment which will bring the maximum benefit to the firm and deciding or selecting the most appropriate proposal is investment decision. The firm invests in funds in acquiring fixed assets as well as current assets. When decision regarding fixed asset is taken, it is also called as capital busting decision. So what are those factors that affect investment decisions? Cash flow of the project. When a company is investing in huge funds in an investment proposal, it expects some regular amount of cash flows to meet their day-to-day -day requirements. The amount of cash flow an investment proposal will be able to generate must be assessed properly before investing in that proposal. The return on investment. The most important criteria to decide in any kind of investment proposal is the rate of return, which it is able to bring back to the company in the form of income. For example, if project A is bringing 10% return and project B is bringing 15% return, then we should obviously prefer project B. The risk involved. With each and every investment proposal, there is some degree of risk which is being involved. The company must try to calculate that risk involved in every proposal and should prefer 
the investment proposal with moderate risk only. The investment criteria are also being considered while assessing the investment decision. Along with risk, return, cash flow, there are various other criteria which are actually helpful in selecting an investment proposal such as availability of labor, technologies, inputs, machinery. A finance manager must compare all the available in alternative very carefully and then only he should decide whether to invest where the most scarce resources of the firm, that is the finance. Investment decisions are considered very important decisions for any kind of company because of the following reasons. They are usually long term decisions and therefore are irreversible. That means once they are taken, that cannot be changed. Second, those involve huge amount of funds, remarkable. And the third, they affect the future earning capacity of the company. So friends, that was all about investment decisions. Now let's consider dividend decisions. Dividend decisions involve the consideration of profit, liquidity, shareholders requirement, tax aspect, and the need for the funds for reinvestment purposes. The management has to decide about retaining the funds for further investment plans without compromising on various income requirements of innumerable shareholders as well. Dividend decision is primarily concerned with distribution of surplus funds. The profit of the firm is distributed among various parties such as their creditors, employees, debenture holders, shareholders and so on. Payment of interest to creditor, creditors, debenture holders, that is a fixed kind of liability of a company. So what the company or finance manager has to decide is what to do with the residual or leftover profit of the company. The surplus profits are either distributed to equity shareholders in the form of dividend or they are kept aside in the form of retained earnings. Under dividend decision, a finance manager decides how much is to be distributed in the form of dividend and how much is to be kept aside as retained earnings. To take this particular decision, a finance manager usually keeps in mind the growth plans and investment opportunities. If more investment opportunities are available, the company has more growth plans, then more is to be kept aside as retained earnings and less has to be given as in the form of dividend. But if in case the company wants to satisfy its shareholders and has lesser growth plans, then more is to be given in the form of dividend and less is to be kept aside as retained earnings. This decision is also called a residual decision because it is concerned with the distribution of residual or leftover income. Generally, a new or an upcoming up, uh, generally new and upcoming companies keep aside more than more of the retained earning and distribute less dividend. Whereas the existing established and stable kind of companies prefer to give more dividend and keep aside less profit. So, what are those factors? Let's talk about those factors which affect dividend decisions. A finance manager analyzes various factors before div dividing the net earnings between dividend and retained earnings. Number one, that should be earning. Dividends are paid out of current and previous earnings. If there are more earnings, then the company declares high rate of dividend. Whereas, if there are low earnings during the period, the rate of dividend is also low. Second comes into the picture, stability of earnings. If a company has stable and smooth earnings, they usually prefer to pay high rate of dividend. Whereas a company with unstable earnings usually prefers to give low rate of earnings. And the third which comes into the picture as cash flow position. Paying dividend means outflow of cash. Companies declare high rate of dividend only when they have surplus cash. In situation of shortage of cash, the company is declared no or very low dividend. Also, growth opportunities need to be considered while taking the decision of dividend payment. If a company has number of investment plans, n number of them, so then it should reinvest those earnings of the company. As to invest in investment projects, company has two options. One, to raise the additional capital or invest its retained earnings. Simple. 
the return earnings are cheaper source as they do not involve any kind of flotation cost or legal formalities. However, if the company has no investment or growth plans, it would be better to distribute more in the form of dividend. Generally, mature companies declare more dividend and whereas the growing companies keep aside more retained earnings. Also, stability of dividend has to be considered while taking decision of dividend payment or not. Some companies follow stable dividend policy and it has as it has a better impact on shareholder and thereby improving the reputation of the company in the share market. The stable dividend policy satisfies the investor. Even the big companies and financial institutions prefer to invest in a company with regular and stable dividend policy. There are usually three types of stable dividend policies. If I'll just brief you about these dividend policies, stable dividend policies. So that is like one constant dividend per share. In this case, usually the company decides a fixed rate of dividend and declares the same rate each every year, like 10% dividend on investment every year, every year, every year. Okay. And the second one, constant payout ratio. Under this system, the company fixes up a fixed percentage of dividends on profit rather than on investment like 10% on profit. So dividend keeps on changing with the change in profit rate. If today I am earning a profit of like 100 rupees, then the dividend amount will be rupees 10. And if it goes for like 1000 rupees, the dividend amount would go for like 100 rupees. 10% on profit rather than 10% on investment. And third, constant dividend per share and extra dividend. Under this scheme, usually a fixed rate of dividend on investment is given. and if profit or earnings increase, then some extra dividend in the form of bonus or interim dividend is always given. Also, preference of shareholders is assured, while, which is one of the most important factors while taking a decision on a dividend payment or not. So, it is the expectation and preference of shareholders that cannot be ignored by any kind of company. Generally, it is observed that retired Retired shareholders expect a regular and a stable amount of dividend, whereas young shareholders, they prefer capital gain by reinvestment of the com income of the company. They are ready to sacrifice their present day income of dividend for future gain, which they will get with the growth and expansion of the company. Secondly, poor and middle class investors also prefer regular and stable kind of dividend, whereas wealthy and rich class, they prefer capital gains. So if a company is having large amount of retired and middle class shareholders, then it is actually going to declare more dividend and keep aside less in the form of retained earnings. Whereas if a company is having large number of young and wealthy shareholders, then it will prefer to keep aside more in the form of retained earnings and declare low rate of dividend. Taxation policy is also required to be considered while, which is one of the primary factors of affecting dividend payout decisions. The rate of dividend depends upon the taxation policy of the government. Under present taxation scheme, dividend income is tax free for uh, income in the shareholders hands, whereas company has to pay tax on dividend given to shareholders. If tax rate is higher, the company prefers to pay less in the form of dividend, whereas if the tax rate is low, the company may declare higher dividend. Apart from that, there are a few access to capital market considerations as well and legal restrictions, there are some contractual constraints, there are some stock market reactions also which truly affect the decision for dividend payout. So guys, that was the holistic conceptual clarity given to you on financing decisions, investment decisions and dividend decisions. Well, in any kind of a company, the aim of the company is to create value for its shareholders. Although other stakeholders are also important, yet the shareholder is the most important stakeholder in any company. The overall objective of financial management is to apply the financial management policies and principles for maximizing the wealth of shareholders in long run. This can be achieved by maximizing the earning per share and keeping the risk at optimum levels. So in a nutshell, we can say the aim of the company is to create the value for its stakeholders. Objective is to apply the financial management policies and principles for maximizing the wealth of shareholders in the long run. And the way to achieve that objective? Simple. 
maximization of earning per share and keeping the rest at optimum levels. In any other company, shareholders expect a rate of return based on the risk they perceive. By maximizing their wealth, we mean providing better than the return they expect. Guys, you tell me, how can a company earn more than the return the shareholders and other stakeholders expect in a, such a hardcore competitive arena? The answer is simple. That can be achieved only by creating a sustainable competitive advantage through exploiting the market imperfections, tapping out those opportunities and identifying the possible threats in advance. Also, the market players do not have the same kind of expectation and risk perception. And it is here the financial management blooms and creates value for its shareholders to appropriate level of trading on equity. So guys, that was all about the principles of financial management. I hope you got the entire clarity about how the financial management functions and decisions work in any kind of enterprise. Now let's move to another important topic of this chapter, that is corporate strategy. In any kind of organization, strategies are the means to end. Corporate strategy are the means by which an organization achieves and sustains success. Value creation is at the heart of corporate strategy. They are the means to end. It is about enabling an organization to achieve and sustain superior overall performance and returns. It involves the activities of defining and refining the corporate vision, mission and objectives problem identification, alternatives generation, and evaluation and selection of those alternatives. It is a core responsibility of top management, including CEO, CFO, and directors. There are usually three levels of corporate strategy. Corporate level, business level, functional level. So let's talk about these levels one by one to get the entire clarity about how these levels work. Let's start out with corporate level managers first. Corporate level managers usually decide what businesses to invest in. The decisions regarding the sources of finance, funds and their allocation are usually taken at this level. This level strategy focus on two dimensions. One is growth, another one is liquidity. Growth dimension refers to growth in sales, growth in assets, growth in growth opportunities. Top level managers need to plan what type of growth strategies suit their market orientation. They will need to effectively choose the optimal growth strategy through various alternatives like expansion into existing businesses, diversification into new strategies from various alternatives like expansion into uh, new businesses, new modes, modes of growth, internal development, acquiring firms and collaborative ventures. Liquidity refers uh, to the level of cash flows required for business efficiency. Corporate strategy provides a framework for attaining the corporate objectives under values and resource constraints and internal and external realities. The overall planning mode for corporate strategy is a balance between proactive mode and reactive mode, depending on how a corporate environment is based upon. For example, in a turbulent environment, proactive mode is suggested that it assumes high risk. But in a stable environment, a reactive mode of functioning may yield better results. So that was all about how corporate level strategy and its related managers work. Now let's discuss about the second important level of corporate strategy and that is business level. Business level strategy lays down the ways in which a company would seek to attain competitive advantage through effective positioning. Forming a successful business strategy involves creating a first-rate competitive strategy. It concerns strategic decisions about choice of products, quality of products, meeting needs of customers, gaining advantage over competitors, exploring, exploiting, or creating new opportunities. The strategy needs to be frequently reviewed against prevailing external and internal environment. Business strategy primarily and broadly talks about the managerial plan for achieving the goal of the business strategy. It is drawn consistent with corporate strategy of a firm and within the framework which is being provided by the corporate planners like the top management uh, principle 
directors, CEOs, CFOs, they deliver their annotation to business level managers and they are the persons who take care of it. The way to compete in a particular business activity, keeping in mind the market competition and orientation, identifying the critical resources and core competencies of the firm, which help in nurturing the core competencies, core competencies of competitive advantages. Core competency gives business reduced cost, improved quality and leads to product development. So that's how this second important level of corporate strategy works. Now let's move down to bottom of the letter and that is the one which functions at the functional, functional level. Functional level strategy managers usually take care of the strategies which are being initiated by support centers of any kind of organization like human resource department, IT department, finance department, production department. To be competitively superior to any other firms, functional level managers strategize to attain super efficiency, superior quality, superior customer responsiveness, superior customer attention and superior innovation. Functional strategy basically talks about the lowest level plan which needs to be carried out by planning principal activities of a business, consistent with both the business strategy as well as corporate strategy. One that move up from bottom whereas strategic plans move from top to bottom. That is the sole difference between corporate level and functional level. The only good interaction between functional planning and corporate planning can provide the interlink between functional plans and corporate plan in any kind of an enterprise might be it can be like ITC or it can be any kind of startup. It has to be a very good interaction between corporate level managers and functional level managers to ensure the growth and success of their organization in a long term. Of all the functional activities, finance assumes the highest importance and is critical to proper planning. While corporate strategy deals with deployment of resources, financial strategies mainly concerned with mobilization and effective utilization of resources. Other resources can be easily mobilized if the firm has adequate monetary base. So guys, that was the complete conceptual clarity of another important topic of SSM that is corporate strategy. With this presentation, I will be winding up lastly with a dose of motivation. Never let a stumble in your road be the end of your journey. You started out one goal, keep that in your mind and finish it up. Don't leave anything in between. With this, I would like to conclude this video. Thank you from Edupedia World. We'll meet you in our next forthcoming presentation. Bye. Take care.